It's no surprise to most of us that siblings can be very different from each other. Different traits, habits, likes. But in today's story, we find that in some cases, two siblings can be almost a mirror opposite of each other. And unfortunately, those differences can affect the people around them. I'm John Lorden. And today, in collaboration with StrangeOutdoors.com, we're looking into the thankfully solved case of the Yosemite Park sightseer murders. On February 12, 1999, 42-year-old Carol Sund, her 15-year-old daughter, Julie, and 16-year-old foreign exchange student, Silvina Peloso, left their home in Eureka, California to go on vacation near Yosemite National Park. Carol and her husband, Jens, owned a realtor business in the Stockton area. They had been hosting Silvina, a foreign exchange student, from Argentina, and she was also a friend of Julie's. She was spending three months with the family. Jens couldn't accompany them to Yosemite because he needed to prepare for an upcoming business trip. After first flying to San Francisco, Carol rented a red 1999 Pontiac Grand Prix. They stopped in Stockton, where Julie took part in a cheerleading contest at the University of the Pacific. They then headed out to Cedar Lodge in El Portal on February 14th, which is located on Yosemite's western slope. They got a room, intending to stay for a few days. On February 15th, the ladies hiked into Yosemite National Park using one of the many trails. That evening, the group grabbed some videos from the lodge's service desk to watch in their room. It was the last time the women were seen alive. The inn staff claimed that when they cleaned the room the following morning, they had detected no evidence of foul play or anything that made them suspicious. The keys were left on the desk in the room. Jens had scheduled to meet them at the San Francisco airport that evening on his way to Arizona, where the girls were supposed to accompany him. The plan was that while he was attending his meeting, the women were going to go and tour the Grand Canyon. He was surprised that his wife didn't meet him at the airport, and he assumed that they had gone ahead and flown to Arizona directly. The next day, he tried to contact them again and failed. He decided it was time to call the police. The rental car company confirmed that Carol never returned the Pontiac and she had not extended their rental agreement. Local police and Yosemite Park Rangers began to search the area where the missing three were last seen. The initial suspicion was that they may have wandered off the main hiking paths and gotten lost in the park. For four weeks, police, family, and volunteers searched the area in and near Yosemite National Park by helicopter, on foot, and even using skis. They were looking for both the missing red 1999 Pontiac Grand Prix as well as the women. Carol's wallet would turn up in Modesto, California, over an hour's drive from where the woman had been staying. It still had cash and credit cards in it. Something was clearly very, very wrong. FBI agent Nick Rossi said, At this point, we have not yet uncovered evidence to allow us to determine conclusively whether this was a tragic accident or a criminal act. Two weeks later, FBI agent James Maddock, who was in charge of the investigation at the time, told the press, we feel almost certain that the women were victims of a violent crime. Because of the discovery of Sun's wallet in suburban Modesto, police and the FBI searched the logical routes in and out of that spot, interviewing homeowners and business owners and others that may have seen them. The Bureau relocated its case headquarters from Yosemite to Modesto at that point, and on February 28th, 12 days after the women's disappearance, hinted that it was no longer treating the Sund incident as a missing persons case, but it was now being considered a murder. More than a thousand leads came in and produced nothing. Still, the Bureau intensified its search, recruiting the use of more high-tech equipment and air support. Jen Sund, offered a $250,000 reward for information that would lead to the return of the missing women. After a few weeks, he upped the sum to $300,000, but still to no avail. Carol's parents, Francis and Carol Carrington, appeared on the Good Morning America TV show to ask for the prayers of Americans and their help in locating their daughter and the children. The other sunned children initially believed their mother and sister Julie would return but by the middle of March, their hopes faded. Time magazine wrote about a heartbreaking moment 
where 13-year-old Gina Sund read a poem she wrote in front of several hundred people gathered in Modesto. Quote, Deep in my heart, I know something my mind does not want to learn. I try to stay strong because I know that's where you'd want your baby to be. But mommy, I don't want you to leave me. The Sund family's worst fears were confirmed when on March 18th, a hiker found a burned out red 1999 Pontiac hidden off of Highway 108 in the Stanislaw Forest region. The California Highway Patrol verified the car's license plate as the Sun's rented vehicle and immediately notified the FBI. Agents arrived at the scene and upon opening the trunk, investigators found two charred bodies. After several days, the bodies were identified as Carol Sund and Sylvina Peloso through dental records. On March 25th, Julie Sun's body was discovered near Lake Pedro in Tulum County. It was badly decomposed and her throat had been cut. Over the next few weeks, a task force including FBI agents and law enforcement from four surrounding counties arrested several known sex offenders, drug users, and ex-convicts with previous charges of violence from within a 75 square mile area between Modesto and Sonoma. The police figure that the killer of the three women was someone familiar with the county, given the location of the Pontiac. The car was hidden off of a spur road where locals dump old refrigerators, cars, and washing machines. By mid-April, those who had been arrested were ordered to testify in front of a grand jury in Fresno, California. Four men were considered as the main murder suspects in the initial inquiries. By the end of June, the FBI had reviewed the testimonies and the evidence linked to the suspects in custody. The Bureau stated that while no one had yet been charged, it felt that those responsible for killing the three women at Yosemite were already behind bars. Then there was another murder. Acting on a tip from a caller who was worried about the whereabouts of his friend, Joy Ruth Armstrong, 26 years old, Park Rangers found her body on the morning of July 22, 1999. It was discovered beyond a campground adjacent to her living quarters in the Forresta community, a group of 30 cabins used by park workers. Her body was next to a stream. She was working for the Yosemite Institute for the past year and had worked on education programs through a partnership with the National Park Service. It was determined that she had probably been murdered on the evening of Wednesday, July 21st. She was seen that day at the Institute offices and was planning to visit a friend of hers in Sausalito, California later that day, but she never made it. When she didn't appear as planned, the friend called the park. Police found her car in front of her cabin, packed for the trip. Chief James Maddox said he himself questioned whether the Bureau could have done anything to prevent Armstrong's killing. Quote, I've struggled with that issue for the last 24 hours and continue to do so. He did feel, however, that the FBI spared nothing to investigate the earlier killings. He said, I'm confident we've done everything that could be reasonably done. On Saturday, July 24th, FBI agents announced at a press conference that a man was in custody on strong suspicion of murder and that a significant announcement would be made shortly. The suspect, Kerry Stainer, had been one of the people questioned after the triple killings in February but at that time, no evidence linked him directly to the crime, and he was released. Because he was the handyman at the Cedar Lodge in El Portal, where the Sun and Peloso group had stayed before they were murdered, his questioning at that time seemed to have been more routine than anything. He had no criminal record, and his only encounter with law enforcement was for marijuana use in 1997. Known as a relatively quiet and even friendly person, Kerry Stainer's only passion seemed to be nude sunbathing and hiking. On days off, he would escape to Laguna del Sol, a nudist colony in Sacramento County. Despite this, he never appeared to behave lewdly nor perversely in public, at least nothing that was noticed by his colleagues at the motel. This time, agents detained him and forced him to answer more questions. Investigators searched his truck and confiscated his backpack for examination, Upon release, the FBI warned him not to leave El Portal. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, a witness claimed that Stainer was angry about authorities seizing his backpack after he was questioned earlier that day. He was also angry about how his truck had been searched. 
Stainer's apartment was searched later in the day, and the authorities discovered evidence that linked him to Armstrong's murder. Special Agent Maddox said, During the last 24 hours, we have developed specific information linking Stainer to the Sun Peloso murders. By Friday, July 23rd, Stainer had disappeared from the area just as agents were coming to arrest him. They caught up with him at the Laguna del Sol nudist colony. Its manager had seen a news story on television and recognized Stainer's photo as one of his guests, so he notified the FBI. Agents returned him to El Portal, planning on putting him through a more lengthy interrogation. However, on the way to his police interview, he confessed to a detective in the car to murdering Joey Armstrong, describing the brutal killing as if he was reading a soup label, said John Bowles, an FBI agent working the case. Once in custody, he also confessed to murdering Carol Sund, Julie Sund, and Sylvina Peloso. He also had a very strange request for his captors. Stainer said to investigators, I want you to get a hold of some producers in Los Angeles. I want a movie of the week made about my story. There was a miniseries made about his brother, Stephen Stainer, and it appears that Carrie had a bad case of sibling rivalry. Back in 1972, at the age of seven, Stephen was abducted and he disappeared for eight years. He would endure unspeakable acts by his captor, but would eventually escape and get to a police station, resulting in his captor being arrested and convicted. A television miniseries would be made about his story in 1989 called, I Know My First Name Is Stephen. The day after Stainer's arrest, he allowed himself to be interviewed by a reporter from KNTV. During the session, another unexpected event occurred. Stainer blurted out, I am guilty. I did murder Carol Sund, Julie Sund, Sylvina Peloso, and Joy Armstrong. None of the women were sexually abused in any way. In the interview, Stainer said that he had fantasized about killing women for the last 30 years and described in detail how he murdered each. He spoke of abandoning the group's rental car with the bodies of Carol and Sylvina inside, returning two days later to burn the evidence and retrieve the wallet, which he dumped in Modesto to confuse authorities. Stainer said he thought he had gotten away with the earlier crimes, but couldn't resist the urge to kill Armstrong after he struck up a chance conversation with her. Concluding the interview, he addressed the victim's family, saying, I'm sorry their loved ones were where they were when they were. I wish I could have controlled myself and not done what I did. FBI sources noted that he had given the FBI details that only the killer would know in such specificity that agents were able to recover evidence confirming his confession. Knives were used in the slayings, and the weapon suspected in Ms. Armstrong's death was also recovered. In his interview, Stainer claimed that hair from his body was left on the bedspread in their motel room, but he returned later and changed the bed. Upon examination by the FBI laboratory, some items have yielded trace evidence. Among other things, the FBI laboratory has found hairs in vacuum sweepings taken from room 509, possible body fluid stains on a blanket, and a latent palm print from the windowsill. Vacuum sweepings taken from inside Joy's house, where Stainer claims to have bound her with duct tape, yielded additional hair evidence. The FBI also seized clothing stained with blood from her body. Although most of the stains were likely to include Armstrong's blood, Stainer was observed to have a laceration on his hand during his interrogation and therefore may have been cut and bled during the attack. Latent fingerprints were also lifted from the interior of Joy's truck, which Stainer admits to touching during his encounter with her. Some who knew Carrie Stainer were shocked at his arrest. Sandy Cox, whose husband owned a window company where Stainer worked previously, said, We've known Carrie since he was a little boy. It just doesn't match up. Out of respect for his family and the victim's family, we don't want to say any more. Sylvina Peloso's mother, Raquel, had a very different viewpoint, saying, I just cannot understand how so many people didn't realize that maybe Stainer was the man, since I heard he was interviewed some time ago. The FBI was initially reluctant because they and many others did not believe that Stainer acted alone. Many local residents were convinced that no one person could have created so much horror. 
the logistics of it say it had to involve more than one person, said Letty Carolyn Berry, owner of the Yosemite Rosebud Lounge, just west of Cedar Lounge. In private, reportedly some members of the Sun Peloso Task Force were even saying the same thing. Many wondered about how difficult it would have been to get the jump on three women at once, without any help, and then dispose of their bodies. The trial of Carrie Stainer was moved from Mariposa County to Santa Clara County in California. In May 2002, Stainer pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity in the 1999 murders of Peloso and the Sons. In mid-July of 2002, the trial began. The court heard a taped confession from Stainer given to FBI agents. In this, he calmly reviewed how he had talked his way into the room under the guise of fixing a leak and then sexually assaulted both girls and brutally murdered Carol Sund and Sylvina Peloso in the room. He then carried Julie to a vista point near Lake Don Pedro, pledged his love to her, and then killed her as the sun rose. The issue was no longer who committed the murders, but whether Stainer was certifiably insane at the time, and whether the confession to the FBI agents was coerced. The court would find that he was indeed sane. Stainer, clad in a red jail jumpsuit, bowed his head, but showed no emotion as Judge Hastings sentenced him to death three times, once for each murder. He was already serving a life sentence for the murder of Joy Ruth Armstrong. The issue of whether his confession was coerced seemed to be resolved when on July 24th, the court heard recorded demands that Stainer made to the FBI agents in exchange for his confession. He demanded that his parents be given the reward money that he be incarcerated at a prison near his parents' home, and that he be given a large cache of inappropriate photographs. In the end, Stainer actually confessed without any of the stipulations he had proposed being provided. The judge said that there was overwhelming evidence against Stainer and that the devastating emotional toll justified execution. Francis Carrington, the father of Carol Sund and the grandfather of Julie, would say, quote, I've never seen anything that's so close to black and white and evil and good as Stainer and our children. I'm so proud of the way Carol and Julie lived, and I'm so ashamed of Stainer. Stainer's father, Delbert Stainer, said that his son was deprived of a fair trial by a kangaroo court and a judge who ignored the defense's arguments. The two brothers of the Stainer family are now both famous in very, very different ways. One brother subjected to unspeakable horror for years. The other created unspeakable horrors. In a bizarre twist of fate, Carrie Stainer is now sitting on death row in San Quentin State Prison in California, and his brother, who helped rescue another child when he escaped the kidnapping situation that he was in, would later get married, have two children of his own, and then die in 1989 in a hit and run accident. He was only 24 years old. Yet another example of how some things in this world will always be seriously mysterious. Are you enjoying these videos of Seriously Mysterious? You can find over 150 episodes of the podcast at seriouslymysterious.com.